Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Maciej and I will be talking for the next 30 something minutes about what the SIG apps is, what we do, what is the future for workload controllers, all sorts of various workload controllers. Uh, my co-presenters is Janet and Ken, who unfortunately were not able to be uh, with us today. They are also co-chairs for, um, for SIG apps. So if you've ever uh, attended our sessions, which are happening every other Monday, you've probably seen either Ken or Janet uh, helping to push your, uh, through your PRs, approve your enhancements, or even just uh, lead the discussions in, the, uh, in our uh, biweekly meetings. Like I said, they are happening every other Monday. Um, I haven't looked at our agenda for the next Monday, 13th, which is the next instance of our call when it should be. Um, because depending on if we have any particular topics, we will hold the call. If there are no topics, uh, we will cancel prior to the meeting. You can also reach us on Kubernetes uh, Slack. There's a SIG apps channel if you have any issues, PRs, um, because I'm fully aware that um, even you, you might be submitting those PRs. It's very hard to uh, with the load of PRs, various PRs across the entire Kubernetes project to go through all of them. I'm, I've, I've announced bankruptcy and GitHub notification years ago. So it's best if you have any particular PRs, just ping us on the, this Slack channel or directly. Uh, I don't mind. I always tell people, ping me, uh, give me a week. If I don't respond, ping me again. Sometimes it, the load varies throughout both the Kubernetes release cycle because it depends or, on where we are. I'll talk about it a little bit more, but it also depends on what's going on with everything else that is happening. And I have a couple of different hats that I'm wearing in the Kubernetes uh, community. So pinging a couple of times, don't, please don't be offended. That doesn't mean that I don't like you. I don't like your PRs or anything like that. That's not the case. It's just the load is... Uh, sometimes is very high and especially towards every freeze, whether that will be enhancement freeze, whether that will be code freeze, whether that will be upcoming next week test freeze, uh, the load is very high and getting through PRs is, um, requires time and attention. Uh, additional option, if you're not into Slack, uh, there's also an email group, uh, so you can reach us on that. Uh, so the, before we get into discussions about the topics that we've been working and we've been finishing and we are currently working on uh, within the apps uh, work group, what we are, what, what the mission behind the, uh, the special interest group is. So basically in very simple terms, it's about running any kind of workloads. Whether that'll be batch, there was a session prior to launch where we were discussing uh, batch workloads uh, we have a separate working group devoted specifically for all sorts of AI ML workloads or HPC. If you're interested into, in, into that topic, you can either bring the topic over to the SIG apps or uh, you can uh, visit the batch working group. We have a dedicated channel just for the batch workloads. Uh, or if you're talking about all sorts of either stateful workloads or stateless, uh, this is covered as a broad ecosystem. Or even if, it, if you have an interesting application that you created, it's either open source or you are open sourcing it, and you would like to share with the broader community that is running on Kubernetes because it is uh, solving a interesting problem, uh, the SIG apps is a place where you wanna uh, share that, that knowledge. I also linked in the slides our annual re report, which is in some ways covering the topics that I'll be talking about and some additional uh, community health um, around the, uh, the apps work group, uh, interest group. So uh, let's go through the features because that's, that's literally the most important, the most interesting part of uh, what the apps work group, uh, interest group, sorry, is working on. So over the past three releases, uh, we've been tackling and promoting several features. Those two that I have currently on the slides. First of them is about tracking uh, 
job status. So if you've been running jobs previously, you might be aware that jobs were basically written in the initial uh, days, in the early days of Cube, somewhere back in 2015, more or less when we were writing it. It was written in such a way that it kept the pods after the pods completed uh, to be able to calculate the status of the job. The problem with that, it was okay until your job was 10, 20 pods. But if you think about a uh, batch uh, type of workloads where you're running 100, 1,000, or even more pods, keeping those 1,000 pods just to be able to count how many failed, how many succeeded, is very irresponsible. And obviously, it is consuming a lot of resources, unnecessary resources, because all of those pods are finished. Uh, we recognized the problem very early on. There is an issue which was literally open a couple weeks or months after we completed the job controller implementation, uh, which said, well, we have to do it differently and we're just looking for volunteers. So as part of the initial uh, task that the batch work group was picking up was just that. So what they did is they created a finalizer, which is placed on every single pod that is created within the, uh, within the job. And that finalizer is being removed, which allows us to properly calculate how many pods finished, whether that was a success or a failure, and allowed us to keep the status without the unnecessarily keeping the resources uh, on the cluster. That G8 in 126, so you're probably, if you're using something newer than 26, you're already on the safe side. If you're prior to 126, uh, I would probably just encourage you to, uh, to jump into 26 or newer cube, uh, especially that we are almost at the time when we will be releasing 129 in less than a month. Uh, the other thing was time zone support in cron jobs. So when we originally wrote cron jobs, we were very opinionated about, yeah, we don't want to support time zones. You probably don't want to do it. And if you want to have some kind of a um, time zone support in cron jobs, we figure out that it'll be best if uh, the, the, the cron job resource will always stick with the time zone that is uh, the one that is set on the Cube Controller Manager, and eventual translation should be done on the client side. So whether you have your web app application or something else, it should be responsible for translating the time zones from whatever you're comfortable with working locally into, um, into whatever is in the cluster. Uh, of course, a lot of people, I think that was one of the most requested features. Uh, thankfully, the all the underlying libraries uh, allowed us to easily enable this feature, and we were able to quickly promote it through all the stages. So that one was G8 in, in 1.27. Uh, moving on to beta features, um, there's a bunch of them that we currently pushed over from the initial stages. The beta basically means that all those features are available in the cluster by default. So if you're interested in any of these and you have the version of the cluster that I mentioned in the parenthesis, you should be able to reuse those features. Uh, first one is pod healthy policy uh, for PDB, so pod disruption budgets. Uh, so pod disruption budgets is a resource that allows you to ensure that this number of pods is uh, available for your application. It is protecting uh, your application from going below that limit. So if someone is trying to evict your pod for various reasons, whether there is a resource exhaustion or you're trying to uh, drain a node or something like that, uh, pod disruption budgets allow you to ensure that a minimal amount of your resources uh, will always be uh, available. By minimal amount of resources, I mean pod specifically. But that raised some issues and eventually during upgrades we noticed that there is a possibility that a pod might not be healthy yet but it is already counted as part of the pdb which prevented in some cases certain upgrades because the pod theoretically was not usable because it wasn't healthy but it was already counted as part of the pdb and that did not allow it to be evicted 
Uh, but because of the backwards compatibility, which we take very seriously within the entire Kubernetes project, we could not just change the default, which was one of the first options that uh, some of us did consider. But uh, we said that, no, we cannot just break users because some of people already started relying on this particular behavior and we're writing additional code around that approach. So what we did was introduce additional uh, field within the pod disruption budget a specification file that field allows you to tell whether you want to use the default which is the previous behavior or the newer behavior which basically tells oh yes it has to be specifically healthy pod to be considered as a valid pod for a pdb and when it's not healthy you can quickly and easily just say yes just evict it if you need to uh, so that is currently in beta we are We've been considering promoting it in 129, uh, but we want to do a lot more testing. So that one is actually uh, is kept as beta for one more release uh, to ensure that once we promote it to stable, it actually be rock stable. Uh, another thing was uh, stateful sets by default will not touch your P, uh, PVCs. Uh, so when you're creating your stateful set, you have an information about what kind of um, volume uh, templates you want to have created. But because we wanted to ensure uh, the data uh, behind the stateful set is always secure and safe, we said, no, we're not going to touch your, uh, your PVCs back in your stateful set. You if you care about it, you have to be explicit and manually do it. It turns out that this works for a lot of the cases, but it appears that there are some cases where people are okay with getting those PVCs deleted. So we decided that we will again extend the stateful set uh, specification with the ability to in, uh, in, uh, opt in, sorry, <laughs> into the ability to, oh yes, I want to have, I'm, I'm fully aware that this is a breaking thing, just whenever you're, I don't know whether migrating pods or uh, scaling up or down, you can safely remove the data behind the stateful set. Uh, we're currently in beta with that one. There are still back a couple of back and forth uh, between the the apps where uh, uh, interest group and uh, the storage group, which is responsible for the storage area specifically. Mm, uh, which we want to go, how far, whether there are all the edge cases already considered and addressed before we will, again, uh, promote it as a stable feature. Another uh, interesting addition that was um, coming from the batch working group is the elastic index job. So if you remember how the job, or if you've ever worked with a job, whether that will be index job or a regular job, uh, it has a certain limitation that was baked in from the day, from the early days, which literally said, if you put a particular number of uh, completions and a specification of a job, you cannot modify it. It turns out that when we were considering supporting uh, various uh, kinds of batch workloads, it turned out that we would like to be able to specify the completions number in some cases. That's when we introduced, that's, that's how we decided to introduce something that is called elastic index job. So in that elastic index job case, you can modify the completions, but only if you're modifying completions along with parallelism. This allows uh, some specific use cases for the batch work uh, for the batch workloads to work even better. Um, if you're interested in more details, there is a cap link and a slide so you can check it out. Um, I'm pretty sure that this will be rather straightforward and we'll be able to push this forward. Uh, rather uh, promptly over the next uh, release or two. Uh, another one which is uh, coming from the batch work group and the entire area of supporting batch in kube natively is retriable and re non-retriable failures for jobs. That is a topic that we've been working for for three, four releases by now. It's still in beta. Uh, I'm not sure if we will be quickly pushing this forward because we still have a lot of edge cases that we want to um, go through and ensure that they are properly covered. 
um, especially around the API for expressing how to consider pods. Uh, so basically, in a normal job case, it has an information, oh yes, I want to have reached this many completions, and the controller will make sure whatever it needs to, uh, to reach that completions numbers. But there are some cases where it's okay to ignore certain, uh, certain uh, uh, groups of failures. Uh, for example, when you're running a batch workload and due to resource exhaustion, some of the pods from the job will get evicted and moved over to a different cluster, then those failures could actually not be counted as an actual failure, but it should be retried in several of those cases. Similarly, if you write your, um, uh, your job such that it will be returning co exit codes uh, for which you know that this is not a problem but rather a setup issue, or differently when there will be a temporary uh, registry problem and the images will not be uh, possible to be pulled to certain nodes, those will be counted as failures. So rather than counting those as failures, we can express currently in, in the job specification what kind of conditions, whether that will be pod, uh, pod conditions or exit codes, what conditions we will not consider as a failing and as a failure and we will allow uh, the controller to retry again. It's an interesting, uh, an interesting area of development. And there has been multiple developments. Uh, recent, addition, recent addition were literally merged over a week ago, so shortly before the actual 129 freeze. Um, moving on with the beta, uh, beta features that we, uh, that we have been uh, working on. Uh, so Stateful Set introduced something that is called Stateful Set Slices. So normally, uh, up until now, we had a specific numbers of uh, replicas that you had in your in your stateful set, but if you are thinking about migrating those stateful set from one cluster to a different cluster, obviously you need some kind of a third party orchestrator to allow that kind of migration uh, scenarios. Uh, you cannot do it manually because the numbers will not match whatever you would expect. Uh, adding a slice over there allows us uh, to say that oh this particular cluster is running the instances of my stateful set from one until five, and the other one is running from five until 10. And then slowly uh, allowing yourself to migrate from one cluster over to the other. Uh, we've noticed there's, there has been a couple of glitches in the stateful set controller due to introducing some of those features. So we're still iterating before moving forward with that one. Uh, if you're interested in that area, uh, I totally welcome you to, to join us, help us with either testing or, or pushing this feature forward. Um, another two additions coming from the batch work group, one which is rather uh, cosmetic, I would say, is adding the labors for uh, pod indexes in either the index job or a stateful set. Very often uh, our users complain that they have no um, support a way to get the, num the, the index number of your pod. Um, they were using downward API to parse that out of the name of the pod in either cases. So we've decided that it'll be probably best to expose this as a label on a, on a pod in both cases that you could easily through downward API get the number. There are some cases where you want to know what is your uh, ordering in case of a stateful set or a job. Um, uh, a rather recent addition, um, I think it was recently promoted, to, but yeah, 27, uh, was a replacement of pods in job when fully terminating. So we basically, um, We differently count the statuses. That's again for the batch work group. Uh, we figure out that the way we are currently exposing that information is rather missing and some people want to have that additional information in the status of the job. So we're slowly expanding um, those things. And lastly, it was also a rather cosmetical change. 
Uh, when working with a cron job time zone, we notice that there's a lot of people who are interested in and knowing the date when the job was created or when the actual schedule for creating a job was. Um, we got an issue when we were rewriting the cron job controller from the previous iteration to the current uh, one, which is a rather older topic, and I had a, a bunch of call, uh, previous dis uh, uh, discussions and presentation around the topic. If you're interested, uh, I'm happy to, to follow up after this session. But basically, uh, we stop putting the timestamp in the name of the job created, and a lot of people actually relied on that fact. And we only put it there as to make the job un to make the job name unique. But actually, people started relying on that uh, that information in the name, which is n something that we did not expect ever anyone would do. But that's how we decided. Oh, well. We want to allow users to have something that they can actually rely on. So we added a new annotation and expose that kind of information. Uh, alpha features that I'm not sure, but I think I have two topics and I'm the alpha feature that I'm thinking about, but it's probably the slides is wrong, is rather a recent addition for 128. Um, where we added uh, the ability to express when you are actually replacing your pods in a job. So when you're, uh, when you're working in a batch work group, in a batch workload, and you're working on very limited resources, whether that's your node capacity or you have a specific quota, and, uh, or you're working with spe uh, specialized hardware, you cannot quickly replace pods, which is a thing that is, that is happening in the normal controller. If you're working or you're used to working with regular controllers, whether that will be deployment, um, uh, replica set, or even a job, the moment it sees a terminating pod, it will replace the pod immediately. But in a case where you're at your limit, replacing the pod is not feasible, or especially if you're reusing a specialized hardware and you use all of the uh, units of your hardware, you cannot make the hardware. It has to be freed first, and only then it can be reused. So for those cases, we decided that we would like to be able to extend uh, the job API with the ability to say, no, replace the pods, but only after it's fully terminated, rather than as soon as it goes down, no, we're waiting for when the, the pod will be either failed or succeeded completely, which will ensure that, the, for example, if you're using specialized hardware, that the hardware is released and you can reuse it. So yeah, I'll, I'll fix the slides after this presentation. Uh, for the topics that we've been working on for 129, which uh, the code freeze for 129 was last week, the couple of things that we were working is exposing information about um, ready uh, pods in your job. Like I mentioned, the retriable and non-retriable failures for job. It's an ongoing topic and probably will be uh, for a couple more releases, replacement pods. And uh, a recent addition, again, coming from the batch work group. As you see, a lot of the topics originate in the batch work group. I would say that more than 60% of the work that the, the SIG apps currently does is around uh, enabling uh, all sorts of various uh, batch work groups. Uh, so we've added uh, the ability to specify back off limit, but previously it was per entire job, uh, which as we saw in the index job cases, it's actually better or more preferable to be able to, to say that only certain indexes can have a little bit different back of limit rather than uh, a global. Uh, the batch work group, I did mention the batch work group a couple of times over the, uh, this entire presentation. If, uh, if you are interested in, in the work that they are doing, the mission, uh, unfortunately, the session for the batch work group was prior to uh, before the launch, uh, so I cannot guide you to, to see that, but I 
I will encourage you to have a look at the presentation as soon as, sorry, as soon as it will be available online in, on CNCF channel on YouTube. But in, in the meantime, what you can do is you can join the biweekly Thursday calls for the batch work group. There's also a Slack channel. And an important thing is that's a Kubernetes Slack channel because there is a separate batch work group within the CNCF Slack uh, they are a little bit higher. Uh, uh, us, the engineers and folks who are writing the batch and the controllers, stuff like Q, uh, we hang out in the Kubernetes Slack. Uh, there's also an email group if you want to reach out to us. And I think with that, I'm open to question. I think there is a microphone over there. Uh, if you have any particular question, if not, I, I will be here for a little while or later on at the Red Hat booth. And I'm happy to take any discussions or topics that we can, uh, that you might want to have. Thank you. Okay, I, it looks like there are no questions. I'll, I'll hang around here for a little while if, if you want to.